Hi, this is Bradley Compton, instructor for LNI Sci 120 Information Technology Ethics for the School of Information Studies at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. This is the Spring 2012 Writing Critical Thought and Analysis lecture, and today we will talk about critical thought and analysis, how we define it in this course, validity and soundness, necessary and sufficient conditions, fallacies, and writing pointers. In this course, we use theory from ethics to analyze topics relevant to information technology, information professions, and the digital age. And we use critical thought and analysis to engage in these topics and theories. I recommend reading Chapter 3 of the Tavani textbook, um, Ethics and Technology, as well as Writing Pointers, uh, the Writing Pointers document and a rule book for arguments document. Uh, these are available in the course content section on the course website. These are supplemental readings, they're not required. In this course we use the Socratic method. Uh, and many of you are probably familiar with what that is. If not, uh, it's it was for, it was introduced in the writings of Plato. Plato's writings had a protagonist named Socrates who would go around Athens in ancient Greece and and annoy people with questions like what is love, what is the good, what is beauty, what is justice, and they'd give an answer and he'd say, well, what about in this situation? And they'd say, oh, well, okay, well, maybe not in this situation, but in this situation, it's and and this would just keep going on until he would reduce them down to. Uh, humiliate them and, and get them to admit that they did not know what these things were. Well, that's what I do in this class. <laughs> uh, that's what uh, I, I challenge the, the positions you have. Even if I agree with you, uh, some students in, interpret this as, as me promoting a particular perspective or tearing down a particular perspective, and what I'm doing is getting you to think about this stuff critically, thinking about what someone else would say that disagrees with you. What someone else says that does disagree with you. Because the nature of what we're talking about in ethics here uh, is up for debate. These things are controversial issues. Now, there, there are standardized codes of ethics for things like the, you know, the American Library Association or ACES or the Computer Programmers Union and the like. But c coming up with these standardized codes of ethics require this kind of engagement, this kind of critical thought, and from time to time you know, the ethical standards are updated for these these codes of ethics and this again requires de grappling with these issues, these issues that come up that need revision or or new issues that come up that need attended to. So try to take this as, op as an opportunity to strengthen your position if you feel very strongly about it and, and don't take it as uh, being picked on or uh, or someone is steamrolling you if uh, your beliefs or anything like that that that's 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 not going to happen I know this isn't an English course or a philosophy course and a lot of the stuff you may not be familiar with or it might be a little uncomfortable for you but critical thought and analysis and good communication are the only way to fully appreciate the nuances of what we're talking about and the only way to get across that you understand what we're doing here. So this stuff is equally important to the topics that we cover. So that's why I make these supplemental lectures to try to reinforce what we're, what we're studying and give you the tools to attend to these issues properly. It, just knowing these issues, just me teaching you these issues and making you memorize these issues and, and case studies and things like that, to me that would be analogous to teaching you calculus by making you memorize uh, formulas and know, make you memorize where all of the symbols are and everything in the formula but not teaching you to work the, the, the problems out. Furthermore, uh, these are transferable skills that we're talking about. They will help you in your profession. They will help you be a better informed citizen, better informed voter, consumer. 
you'll think five steps ahead of the average person because most people do not engage in critical thought analysis. So let's begin. Critical thought analysis. What is critical thought analysis? How do we define it? I will mention critical thought and analysis in my grading of your work. I will either say that you are exhibiting good critical thought and analysis or that your work lacks critical thought and analysis. Now, critical thought and analysis is has a, has a wide scope, but for the most part, all I mean is the following. Give a statement, a thesis, an argument, a theory, proposition, analogy, so, some statement. Provide a counter argument. Respond to that counter argument. Do this a sufficient number of times back and forth, and then conclude. Think of this as what goes on in a courtroom. You have two attorneys, they develop cases, they develop arguments, they anticipate counter arguments from their opponent and respond to counter arguments in court. They make concluding statements and a verdict is reached. So you give a statement, you provide a counter argument, you respond to the counter argument, you do this back and forth and draw a conclusion. Arguments follow this kind of simple formula of just statement, 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 conclusion. The statements are called premises. So premise, 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 conclusion. Validity and soundness are two of the most primary fundamental ways that arguments are assessed. The validity, the validity that we're talking about isn't the type of validity that, that you see in that, that, they, that we talk about in, in, in social research. We're talking about argumentative, you know, logical validity. And it, so we define that by saying that if the premises of an argument are true, then the conclusion must follow. Uh, for a, an argument to be valid. and So an argument is valid when the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. So let's look at an example of an argument and uh, that's, that's valid. Unlicensed music downloading is the same as shoplifting. Shoplifting a CD from a store. That's premise one. Premise two, shoplifting is wrong. Conclusion, therefore, unlicensed music downloading is wrong. This argument is addressed by Tavani in the Tavani textbook on page 232. Only instead of talking about music, he talks about proprietary software, but the argument is still pretty much the same argument. So, why is this valid? Well, it just, it it necessarily follows that unlicensed music downloading is wrong if in fact unlicensed music downloading is shoplifting and shoplifting is wrong. It just has to be the case that unlicensed music downloading is wrong. Soundness is like validity. It's just it adds another criterion to validity. It says that if an argument is valid and the premises are true, then the argument is sound. So an argument is sound if the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises and the premises are true. Now this previous argument that we just looked at is valid, but I think a good case can be made by uh, that it is not sound. Because I think the, the, a good case can be made that the first sentence is incorrect. Uh, unlicensed music downloading is the same as shoplifting a CD from a store. And we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more when we talk about the fallacy of false analogy coming up in a minute. I think a good case can be made that that statement is a false analogy. Necessary and sufficient conditions are two, two fundamental concepts in argumentation. A necessary condition is one that must be satisfied in order for a statement to be true. <clears throat> And a sufficient condition, if satisfied, assures the statement's truth. So we'll be talking about theories in the next lecture. 
uh, and you've probably begun reading about theories this week. So let's talk about one of the theories that we use in this class, relativism, and use that as an example to show what necessary and sufficient conditions are. Let's take this statement. Observation of diversity and moral values is a necessary condition for the meta-theory of relativism. Belief in the absence of any objective moral truths is a, is a sufficient condition for the meta-theory of relativism. What's the difference here? Well, observation of moral of diversity and moral values is a necessary condition for the theory of relativism because that is the main reason relativism was developed as a theory. It was observation of diversity and moral values. It says that because we see all of these various differing sets of moral values between cultures, we can't really determine which one is correct. We can't establish a, uh, a, a correct set of principles. So we can only judge the rightness and wrongness of beliefs and behaviors from, from within the culture within which these beliefs and values and behaviors occur. Belief in the absence of objective moral truths is a sufficient condition for relativism because that's pretty much synonymous with what relativism is. Um, so why is observation of diversity and moral values not a sufficient or a sufficient condition? Why is it not a sufficient condition for relativism? Well, other theories acknowledge that there is diversity in moral values. Uh, the, the theory of absolutism, which is pretty much the polar opposite of relativism, which states that there is only one correct set of moral principles uh, and, and objective truths in the world, uh, acknowledges that there are varying views on morality in the world. It just says that there is only one correct set of moral principles, and anything that diverges from that is incorrect. So that can only be a necessary condition for relativism, but belief in the absence of objective moral truths is sufficient because it is what makes relativism relativism.